Thank you, Lorena. Thanks, everybody, uh, for taking the time out of your busy day to uh, spend a little time with us. I'm going to try to get through the content I have today in about 30 minutes and leave some time for Q&A. If for whatever reason we don't get to your question today uh, in the live session, we promise we will follow up with you directly. So today I'm going to talk about uh, how you get out of the starting blocks with GDPR compliance. I know you've probably had a uh, 100 vendors tugging on your sleeves with every one of them uh, telling you that the way you deal with GDPR compliance is whatever they're selling. Uh, we're not going to uh, take that approach with you today. We are going to talk about some kind of basic things that you can do to get going uh, with improving your GDPR compliance posture uh, and just kind of give you some footing in terms of uh, basic informational overview. So my agenda here is to talk about the basics of GDPR, why it's urgent to start moving on it now if you haven't already, figure out where you fit into the hierarchy that the EU has defined here, because that has a big impact on what your responsibilities and you know, technical obligations are. Start thinking about how you can begin upgrading basic building blocks like your backup and storage uh, to uh, improve your GDPR compliance posture. No coincidence, that's something we can help you with, and I promise to keep the Acronis commercial to a very brief minimum at the very end. Uh, uh, but we, we are definitely of the belief that um, since GDPR is driven by uh, the privacy of user data, uh, that a really good place to start thinking about that is uh, how you store it and uh, how you back it up and how you otherwise protect it, uh, in other words, with uh, security measures. Uh, as you'll see why. So if you're not familiar with uh, uh, the basic definition here, uh, the EU has decided that it needs to make companies take much more stringent steps to protect uh, the private data of the EU residents. And if you're familiar with the old uh, privacy standards coming out of the EU, uh, the new definition of what constitutes personal data is uh, rather broader. Uh, you also have to worry about um, uh, basic identifying, personally identifiable information uh, to include things like uh, location data and cookies and other things that, uh, that you end up collecting about your customers in the course of doing business with them online. Another common misconception is, is if you're not based in the EU, you don't have to worry about it. That is a, a really a deadly mistake to make. If your customers, any of your customers reside in the EU, you have to take steps to protect uh, the privacy of their personal data, regardless of where you're headquartered. Uh, you're going to have to uh, take steps to get explicit consent to collect information on users that I know as a marketing guy, that has huge ramifications for me. You know, I run marketing campaigns uh, to folks via email and uh, uh, among other things, and uh, I'm going to have to go out and make sure those people are fine with me still sending them email again. There's also this uh, new right of, the, of your EU-based customers, which is to request the erasure of all of their personal data after they decided they don't want to do business with you for whatever reason. That so-called uh, right to be forgotten is a, is a tricky one, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. I mentioned that a security breach notification gets much more um, onerous under GDPR. You're going to have to notify your supervisory authority, the, the, the local uh, uh, regulatory authority within 72 hours of a breach. And if it's bad enough, you're going to have to notify your customers too. And that, that's ugly. You know, we're going to talk about a little bit about how avoiding breaches in the first place is probably easier uh, than dealing with uh, the ugliness of uh, that kind of public disclosure uh, for reasons I'm sure are obvious. You know, it hurts the brand. It's expensive. It's a complex pain uh, to handle all those notifications. You can lose customers, it can hurt your stock price. Uh, it's embarrassing. So for all those reasons, we're gonna talk a little bit about breach avoidance as opposed to just a breach notification. If you're a public institution or if you're uh, large enough, you're also gonna have to 
uh, appoint someone with your organization or hire somebody to be the data protection officer. That's a, a new role. That's basically the sort of one throat to choke on GDPR issues. Someone that's ultimately responsible for educating uh, everybody in your company, uh, what their obligations are, and uh, uh, handling all the other uh, responsibilities around partnerships and uh, uh, answering, you know, answering up to the obligations that you have uh, to your EU-based customers around their personal data. The clock is uh, really ticking on this one. I can remember uh, when I first started looking at GDPR uh, back in uh, early 2017, I, I had a certain sense of complacency about it. It's you know a year, almost a year and a half away. Days fly by. Uh, it, we're busy with every our, our everyday obligations, and um, suddenly here it is March, and the cutover is just a few weeks away. So uh, it, it's time to get moving, uh, and the, the fines for noncompliance are seriously non-trivial. So there are some basic violations that you can be caught at that the EU is planning on levying fines of 2% of your annual revenue or 10 million euros, whichever is bigger, phew. And if you get caught in some really serious uh, violation, it's 4% of your revenue or 20 million euros, whichever is bigger. So um, if you're a small company, you probably won't be one of the ones that gets made an example of early on. But given these numbers, it's probably not wise to dither too much longer, because uh, if you get whacked with these, that's, uh, that's really going to sting. I wanted to talk about some uh, basic uh, concepts here. Uh, just learning the vocabulary is kind of uh, step number one. And I'll go through these quickly. You've got the content here. Uh, the data subject is actually the custom reviewers that resides in the EU and that you're collecting some information on them that qualifies as personal information, stuff about them that you would, most customers would rather not have getting around either in the hands of uh, people in your organization that don't have any business looking at it or outside actors who might uh, not have the best intentions uh, of what to do with the data if they got their hands on it. I'm talking about state actors, um, uh, rogue elements of your uh, government that are kind of overstepping their surveillance authority, um, and of course, uh, uh, garden variety criminals uh, who would love to make hay of your financial information, your health records, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, controller is a, a kind of an important concept, and I'm going to contrast that with processor. Uh, controllers and processors end up handling uh, personal data of data subjects one way or another. You're the controller if you're the front line of, uh, of, of capturing it. So you're the taking the customer's orders or uh, c capturing information about them uh, one way or another. Processors are typically uh, partners or contractors of controllers. Um, they're also handling the data, but they're not the primary interface uh, to the customer. So um, uh, obvious examples of this are uh, a controller hiring a cloud service provider or getting cloud storage for someone, uh, using hosted applications uh, 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 out on the web, uh, that's, that's a processor. Uh, both entities have uh, significant responsibilities here about protecting uh, personal data, but if you're the controller, uh, you really got to think about owning the responsibility uh, primarily and it's up to you to kind of make your processors fall into line to make sure that they don't screw you up uh, by mishandling customer data. Acronis is an example of someone who's both a controller and a processor, which is a thing uh, that can happen. So we are uh, selling um, backup software uh, to customers uh, and capturing their information directly. We also provide uh, cloud backup and cloud storage services to a bunch of our partners who are also selling backup services. And so in that uh, regard, we're, uh, we're a processor. And so our obligations in each of those roles is slightly different. I talked already about personal data. Just understand that it's, it's not just the old concept of uh, PII that we're familiar with from older regulatory regimes. 
uh, there's, uh, I think in particular, a lot of the marketing information that you might collect on a person around uh, um, their location and uh, their browsing habits, et cetera, uh, are now included in that definition. So uh, you have a much broader uh, swath of uh, data potentially to worry about protecting. I mentioned the right to be forgotten. Um, again, this is the notion of when the customer says, you know, I don't want to do business with you anymore. I've, I'm moving to another bank or I'm moving to another healthcare provider. Erase all my uh, personal information. And you're going to have to figure out a way to respond to that uh, pretty quickly, uh, you know, within a matter of days uh, in, in most cases. Uh, in the backup business, we consider this to be a little tricky because uh, it's, it's not a trivial matter uh, to delete a, a subject's uh, personal data uh, from, uh, from a set of backup archives, but we'll get into that in a little bit. Breach notification is, uh, is uh, uh, personal data breach is the other kind of good basic concept you need to know, and that's basically anything that happens to personal data that destroys it or alters it or uh, lets someone look at it, uh, get access to it uh, that shouldn't. And uh, you're going to have to get much more on your toes about uh, uh, monitoring for breaches, uh, reporting them when you get hit, and uh, potentially having to notify your customers too. I mentioned before that it's, it's kind of important to understand if you're a controller or a processor. I, I don't think this is like a super tricky concept, but it's worth examining since you, you can be uh, both or neither. If you're neither, then you don't have to, you can probably leave this session now. Um, but if you're processing information about people, if you're deciding what information you're going to keep, and if you decide how to use it, um, you're, um, you're certainly um, a controller. If you can only answer one of those, uh, chances are you're just a processor. If you're not the front line to the customer, uh, but you are handling data on behalf of uh, someone that you're providing services to, uh, you're, you're a processor. As you'll see, it's important to think about where you store data. Uh, GDPR is pretty stringent about um, uh, where, where data gets stored. It's the European Union is worried about data being stored in countries where there aren't stringent protections uh, on uh, citizen data. So um, you either have to store your data, and that includes backups, in countries on the EU's uh, approved list, which outside of the EU is pretty short, only a handful of countries. And uh, um, aside from that, you have, you're going to have to uh, take some steps to prove that you're, uh, if it's not on the approved list, that you're going to, um, uh, you're taking all the necessary steps that you need to, to meet their standards on, uh, uh, on protection of personal data. Uh, you'll also find things like uh, being able to search and find data is going to come in handy for a bunch of reasons I'll talk about in a little bit. Understand that privacy protection failures aren't just about breaches. It's not just about criminals coming in with like a ransomware attack and encrypting your data and, you know, demanding uh, uh, you pay them online in Bitcoin or you'll never see your data again. That would be bad. That would certainly be a GDPR violation. But it's other more kind of everyday things, too, that can, uh, can put you in a tough spot. Hard drive failures, uh, you know, software errors, plain old operator errors. You know, if you, uh, uh, you're a storage tech and you, uh, uh, you run some script that you haven't fully debugged and uh, you, you corrupt some data, that's bad, too. And you, uh, that may put you in a spot where you need to fess up uh, to the authorities. Uh, understand uh, that you've got a bunch of new obligations to users um, about their privacy and there are a lot of things that they can ask you to do that you cannot charge them for. You got to do for free basically for them uh, that you did not have to do before, uh, which is basically let them know exactly what it is that you're collecting of their personal data and why you're doing it. Show them what you're collecting. Let them fix mistakes if they find any, and then erase it all if they want nothing to do with you anymore. 
So one of the things you're going to have to think about is exportability of data. Um, I, I know we've got a tricky one that we um, uh, had to think about, uh, which was, all right, if they request the right to be forgotten, we can delete their records in our uh, the customer relationship management system. You know, we use Salesforce. In our marketing automation system, we use Marketo. You know, presumably uh, there's uh, order entry. You know, our uh, supply chain management system might have some data about them. Uh, we might have something on them in our credit system, our, uh, um, our accounts payable. Uh, it's, it, it, I understand when you start doing data inventory that you may end up collecting customer data in a ton of different places. So you're going to want to put some uh, kind of meticulous procedures in place so that you can honor things like erasure rights. Um, it gets a little tricky with backups because, you know, you don't want to delete a whole backup archive just because one person wants to be forgotten. Uh, it kind of defeats the purpose of backup, but there are ways to manage that. Um, you know, one, I mentioned a, an issue that we had before is what about comments in our user forms? You know, we have tech support forms where users can swap tips on, uh, uh, on dealing with backup issues. And uh, do those have to be deleted too? And the answer is, not if you get them to agree up front that we can keep their comments around uh, even after they're no longer our customer. So that's an example of a way um, that you deal with the right to be forgotten. It, it's going to affect a lot of different little things. So uh, I, I know this uh, can seem a little bit daunting. Uh, you know, from our perspective as a data protection company, we think focusing on the building blocks is a good way to kind of cut through the inertia and get yourself out of the starting blocks on it. Um, you know, think about where you're storing data and where you're backing it up. Uh, uh, think about um, privacy issues, you know, how well you're, uh, what you're doing to protect data in your care. Uh, think about uh, how you're providing access to the data, who gets access to it internally. That's, you know, you really have to manage uh, internal uh, user privileges to make sure that uh, uh, the only the folks that need to look at personal data get to. And then that whole security discipline around monitoring for breaches and uh, uh, recovering from them and notifying the appropriate authorities where necessary. We're gonna, I'm going to talk specifically about issues that uh, GDPR really cares strongly about, like where data is stored, how you're keeping it secure, how you're letting users look at it and what you do uh, when uh, some of the personal data in your care is harmed or uh, stolen or otherwise uh, accessed without authorization. I alluded to this before. Uh, the, when you hear the term cross-border data transfers, that's uh, the EU saying, look, you can't move personal data EU citizens outside of the EU except under except to locations that we've previously approved or under circum cer certain circumstances that we allow. So you can see the, uh, the purple box in the lower right there is a list of uh, EU plus uh, a few uh, European economic area countries um, uh, that are approved. Uh, the teal colored box there is the handful of countries that aren't EU members, but they think have adequate protection standards. And then uh, uh, the U.S. appears to be uh, 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 governed under the uh, Privacy Shield Agreement, though we have some concerns about uh, the commitment of the current administration to follow through on that. Our president has made some comments that, uh, that suggest that we're only tentative, tentatively committed as a country uh, to protecting uh, uh, the private data of uh, EU citizens. Security of processing is the other, uh, another great uh, EU umbrella term where they talk about uh, all the things that you need to do, all the steps you need to take to protect personal data. We think there's some pretty simple steps here that you can focus on, like encrypting data on the device, uh, in the network, and wherever you store it or archive it at the other end. Uh, you know, step up your auditing game to uh, keep track of suspicious behaviors use um, role-based 
uh, limitation of individual user rights, and here I'm talking about your employees and your partners, uh, uh, basically limiting who has access to personal data and what they can do with it. Um, mo again, monitoring to uh, keep an eye on what's going on. Retention rules are a good one. Uh, there's a kind of a principle of um, minimization of data, which is basically uh, only keep as much data as you need to uh, to do your job with it and only keep it around for as long as you, uh, the minimum amount of time you absolutely need to for your purposes. So retention rules, both from a policy perspective and in your uh, technology infrastructure uh, can help you address that. Having some flexibility on uh, where you store and back up your data is also going to be important uh, if you uh, need to be compliant with uh, cross-border data transfer rules. Uh, when it comes to data subject rights, you're going to have to respond quickly to user requests, access their data, uh, uh, understand why you're, why you're collecting it, where you're keeping it, uh, what you're doing with it, how long you're keeping it around for, and uh, doing things like rectifying errors when they find them, um, and uh, erasing their data when they uh, want to get rid of it, they, they, they no longer want to do business with you, and giving them their data in a format that they can read easily. You know, it's got to be something like a zip or a, a PDF. Breach policy, again, I, uh, this is going to be a, a, an ugly one for companies and probably the first place um, that the supervisory authorities of the EU on GDPR are going to start making examples of companies, um, which is uh, how you deal with what you do to uh, prevent breaches, um, you know, how you uh, keep abreast of what's going on so that you know uh, when they happen what you do to recover from them, and how you're set up to uh, notify the authorities and potentially your, your customers. Uh, you know, we, uh, we're intently focused on uh, ransomware here at Acronis because it's, uh, you know, probably the fastest growing malware threat out there. And uh, given that we have technology to uh, fend that off, we like to say, you know, it's better to stop a breach fend off an attack than it is to have to deal with the consequences of it uh, under GDPR because they're painful, it's expensive, and potentially embarrassing. All right, uh, I'm very quickly gonna, um, you'll, you'll notice a few features of our, uh, our backup. You know, we, we do backup software that you can install on your own premises. We offer cloud-based backup services that uh, we offer directly and through our partners. And most of our customers are using a combination of those two things. They're doing local backups in their own facilities and they're using a, a cloud-based uh, backup either from us or from one of our uh, service provider partners. So in our, um, um, our data protection uh, products and services, we've got things like encryption to, to keep data safe so that if someone does manage to break in and steal it, uh, they can't really do anything with it. Um, tools for uh, keeping an eye on your environment, uh, like audit logs that can also help you demonstrate uh, to the authorities that you're taking the right steps and that if there's a breach that it wasn't uh, due to, uh, say, uh, uh, an insider uh, within your organization. Limiting the ability of other people uh, to get at data using uh, uh, role-based definitions for uh, access, you know, minimum privilege uh, for your uh, for your roles and the ability to delegate that uh, by department, by geography, et cetera. Uh, monitoring capabilities, we've got very slick dashboards with uh, alerting and reporting to uh, make sure you know what's happening with your data um, that you haven't been breached. And retention rules that say uh, after this, after we've got uh, two archives in hand. We've gone through two backup cycles. Let's uh, make sure that we delete the oldest one uh, automatically so that we're not keeping data around uh, any longer than we have to. We've got capabilities that make it easy for you to uh, respond to uh, data subjects requests of, for, to look at and uh, alter and uh, erase uh, their personal data. And we've got great capabilities to uh, help you honor cross-border data transfer restrictions. 
So for I'm going to skip ahead here just to show you we've got this uh, global network of highly secured data centers, uh, many of which are in uh, countries that are on uh, the EU uh, approved list. So that if you're looking for um, cloud-based uh, storage and uh, backup services, uh, we can help you out with that. A couple of other um, uh, cool uh, uh, leading edge kind of capabilities we have uh, that I think are uh, awesome uh, uh, in this context are Notary, which is our ability to certify uh, storage, archive, storage uh, backup archives, and things like audit logs um, uh, via blockchain. Uh, so that you can attest that uh, data hasn't been altered, that a backup archive hasn't been altered, and that your audit logs uh, also have integrity in the wake of an attack. I know a lot of attackers these days like to go after the IT infrastructure uh, to make it difficult to for forensics and uh, uh, to kind of hide what uh, hide their tracks. Basically, um, ransomware is like a popular smokescreen side attack while they go in and try to exfiltrate personal data. And uh, our notary uh, feature uh, prevents that because we're we're certifying the uh, uh, the fact that uh, your data hasn't been altered uh, using blockchain. Active protection is uh, our other super cool feature. This is basically a feature built into our uh, both our business uh, backup products and our uh, consumer uh, backup product, uh, which is a piece of the backup agent that looks for uh, ransomware attacks. It's basically a machine learning based uh, uh, behavioral detection, uh, anti-malware capability, uh, identifies malware-like behavior, stops it, stops the process, and uh, instantly recovers any files that uh, might have been encrypted uh, before the attack was detected. And uh, that's one of those things that uh, if you're worried about ransomware, you should be. If you're worried about it in the context of GDPR, you should be, since that's one of the likelier uh, breaches that you're likely to suffer. Uh, and we like to say that with our backup uh, in place, uh, that's a worry that you can take off the table. All right, just to uh, uh, kind of sum up what I uh, hope you get to have taken away here. Uh, get familiar with the, the the basic terminology here. You know, share this with uh, with your colleagues that also have to worry about this. Help explain to people what your role is as a company if you're a controller, a processor, or both, and understand what that means. I I, I no longer have to uh, really wave my arms too much when uh, the cutover date is really just a matter of weeks away. Uh, May 25th. That's coming up fast. And uh, from the perspective of a data protection company, we think that data protection, uh, your backup and your storage infrastructure and services are an obvious place to start. And, uh, you know, again, focus on the security of your data. Make sure that you're not uh, in violation of uh, cross-border data transfer rules in terms of where you store it and archive it. And get ready to respond to some new uh, user requests. I, I, I think... Uh, it's probably going to happen slowly, but eventually users are going to figure out, uh, probably socially, uh, that this is a, a right that they have and it doesn't cost them anything. So you may suddenly find yourself dealing with a flood of those kind of responses. Um, I've got some uh, additional information uh, to point you to here of, uh, on our website. I've uh, written a bunch of content uh, that re recapitulates some of the information that I've uh, put here today. We've also got um, uh, a research report from uh, analyst firm IDC on GDPR, and uh, they say some nice, nice things about uh, how we are uh, helpful with our products in, uh, in uh, helping you get there, uh, but it's even without uh, uh, the, the nice things they say about us, it, it's a useful uh, educational piece there at the end. Uh, you'll also find a series of articles on the Acronis blog that I think uh, will be very helpful to you. So there, I didn't go too far over my uh, half hour attempt here. Um, uh, I, let me, I've got one um, uh, question in front of me here uh, that I'll, uh, I'll answer immediately here. 
can you have the client sign a waiver of their GDPR rights when dealing with my company? I, I think the answer is uh, well, first. Um, my uh, corporate counsel has uh, made sure that I start with this every time. And this is something I've been saying for a, a long time. I, in my previous role at, a, at HFS Research, I wrote about security issues as they were related to cloud. And that had me talking a lot about contracts and service level agreements. Uh, but let me reiterate, I'm not a lawyer and you shouldn't take my advice uh, uh, as uh, urging you to do or not do anything. Uh, so take it with a gigantic grain of salt that you really ought to verify anything around legal matters and contractual matters with appropriately expert legal help. And that that's not me. I'm just a I'm just a data storage and backup and security nerd. I can't uh, I'm, uh, I have no uh, no shingle on legal issues. But that said, it, I think many companies will address uh, th this GDPR question by trying to get their customers to just waive their rights as part of a, um, a EULA uh, when they sign up for a service or whatever. The issue that you have to be concerned with is that GDPR is already aware that companies often try to bury these things in, uh, you know, licensing agreements that no one bothers to read. And they're not going to really let you get away with that. Um, the the, the uh, uh, regulations are really clear that you've got to be really upfront and explain really clearly to users what you're asking them to do. So I, I think you can do it, but it's, it, it, it's going to carry some risks, I think. Um, because if you don't if you don't do it in a way that's completely upfront and honest, you're uh, putting yourself um, in the crosshairs of regulators. And if you do if you are really upfront and honest about it, some of your potential customers are going to be like, mm, I don't know if I want to sign away my privacy rights, and they'll go find someone else to do business with. So I, um, if that's a strategy that you're thinking of uh, adopting as a way of kind of buying yourself some time uh, to implement the other things that you need to do to get GDPR compliant, uh, I'll say that that carries some risks with it, that it's not, uh, that that's not a panacea that I would, uh, uh, that I would recommend. Uh, get your ducks lined up in a row as quickly as possible and look to, um, uh, you know, waiver type of things uh, with a kind of a big squint in your eye because GDPR is aware that a lot of companies would try to do this and they've written the regulations in such a way that uh, uh, to, to really uh, protect users against that kind of, those kind of, uh, let's call them a shell game. Uh, I hope that answered that. Um, another question from, uh, I don't know if this is from the same anonymous attendee, but anonymous, uh, anonymous attendee question number two. Is Acronis, is Acronis working on quantum computing evolving, considering it's just around the corner? This is in regard to maintaining encryption. This is an awesome question and uh, one that particularly excites uh, a security dork like me. Uh, I, you know, quantum encryption, quantum computing really is about to uh, kind of unravel uh, all of our um, uh, existing infrastructure around encryption. You know, the, the part of the basis of, of, of all modern encryption that secures communications and data on the internet is the difficulty of uh, factoring um, uh, products of uh, very large uh, prime numbers. Uh, you know, the, the conventional uh, microprocessor architectures uh, make that really difficult. And so if you make the number big enough, um, it, uh, uh, it, 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 uh, the entropy of it demands that uh, all the processing computer, all the processing power of all the computers on the planet would have to spend thousands of years uh, coming up with a solution to that uh, via brute force. Quantum computing is much better at mathematical operations like that and can solve those uh, those puzzles much more quickly. And that's really bad news um, uh, for all our existing encryption infrastructure. 
the uh, I, I think we have some time here. Um, I, I don't agree with the notion that it's just exactly around the corner. Uh, there was a, a great um, article in The Economist just the other day um, that talked about uh, uh, where the kind of the progress at the leading edge of actual quantum computers. And uh, one of the issues that uh, that they have right now is that their accuracy is not great. Um, they're they're coming up with incredible speed, and the architectures uh, uh, do some things that conventional uh, microprocessor architectures are not capable of doing uh, quickly. But uh, they're really there's a lot of work yet to be done on accuracy. We're also at the very very beginning of a very uh, long cost curve. It's going to be a long time before the cost of quantum computers is going to be inexpensive enough for um, them to appear in everyday applications. That said, um, once we get to a point where it's not um, obscenely expensive, you can expect uh, 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 America's NSA and its counterparts in uh, major nation states around the world uh, to have that. So there are, there are very serious ramifications there. Um, I, uh, uh, we're keeping a very close eye on it. Uh, you know, that's obviously extremely important in our business, uh, but we don't see it as a, a kind of an imminent uh, practicality um, in uh, everyday life just yet. Uh, there's a good chance that the Security arms of nation states are already uh, capable of uh, finding um, your most tightly secured data by means other than brute force encryption or brute force decryption. Um, uh, but that's still a difficult and expensive thing. You really need the expertise and resources that only those state actors have. Uh, to be able to do that. And, you know, the reasons that they do it aren't for like everyday criminality. Their uh, they're, they're, they're focus is rather narrower. So chances are that the data that you're storing in your company is not uh, worthy of their attention. Um, but it's definitely something to keep an eye on. It's really going to upend the apple cart uh, uh, in a lot of applications, not just uh, the security of, uh, uh, of personal data and uh, uh, data uh, in transit over networks. I know that was kind of a long-winded answer to a kind of complicated question. I hope uh, I hope that helped. All right, we are nearly up against uh, 45 minutes. Uh, does anyone else have any more questions? You know, you've, my email is up there. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter uh, and reach out to me there. Uh, I've put my phone number up. A uh, bunch of different ways that you can reach out to me directly if you have any follow-up questions that didn't occur to you or, you know, you're like me and you sometimes feel a little odd about asking your very specific question in a public forum. All right. Uh, with that, I thank will you, uh, ask. Um, oh, thank you so you much, Lorena. Questions? Thank you, everybody. Um, thank you for your presentation today. Um, I just want to remind everyone that this has been recorded and you will be receiving an email with the recording uh, so that you can review it, share it with your colleagues, um, and just um, keep preparing for GDPR. Uh, again, we do have one question that just came through. Um, I don't know if you can see it, if we have a bit of time to answer it. Sure. Okay. So um, uh, Rodney Franklin asks, what is the difference between a data processor and a data controller? So I'm kind of going to go back to uh, uh, what I uh, covered here a little bit earlier. The In both cases, both the controller and the processor are handling uh, personal data as defined by uh, GDPR, which is, you know, sensitive uh, data about a resident of the EU uh, that they've defined in rather broader terms than the old uh, definition of personally identifiable, uh, identifiable information that you might be familiar with from things like uh, Sarbanes-Oxley and uh, HIPAA, et cetera. It's, it's a little bit broader, but it all focuses on uh, are you handling that data? The controller is generally the uh, entity, the business or the government uh, agency that is the first line of interaction 
with the data subject, with that resident of the EU whose uh, 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 data your business or organization is capturing, and you're deciding what to do with it. Um, the processor is somebody that the controller uses um, as part of their handling of that data subject's personal data, which is to say, uh, for example, um, uh, you are uh, running uh, your own business largely out of your own data center. You know, you control a lot of your own applications, but you use um, some hosted applications. You use uh, application hosting providers or you use um, a cloud services provider for storage. You know, you're using um, Amazon S3 or Microsoft Azure uh, for storage or computing resources. That's a processor. Uh, so they're not the primary interface to the customer. It's not, they're not making the decision about why to capture the data, what to do with it, uh, et cetera but they are handling it and since it's in their their um uh in their systems at some point their networks that means it is potentially vulnerable uh to failures of privacy protection whether it's theft or tampering or destruction so they too have um uh, responsibilities and obligations to those uh, data subjects under GDPR um, I, I think if you're the controller, uh, you have the first line of responsibility to protect that user's data. And that means that it's up to you to go to any processors that you're using and say, let's look and see if you're doing everything that you need to to protect me to make sure that I, uh, you don't put me in violation of uh, GDPR uh, regulations. And in some cases, you may have to renegotiate your contracts and your service level agreements uh, with those third party providers, you know, cloud storage, cloud backup, application hosting, uh, software as a service, uh, those sorts of things to make sure that the, the partners that you're using, you know, services that you're outsourcing are meeting the same standards that you're being held to by GDPR in terms of uh, protecting um, uh, uh, protecting the personal data of your customers who live in the EU and uh, responding appropriately in the wake of things like security breaches. I uh, hope that answered that. We have another question coming in. This is another, these are all great questions, by the way. Um, so anonymous attendee asked, do you think the EU would have the power to find a company in the US it doesn't seem that the U.S. extends its enforcement under HIPAA to the Philippines or India. They do comply because of the opportunity. Is this the same case? And are there implement, implementation specifications to comply? Okay, that's a few, uh, a few strong questions here. Um, yeah, the EU absolutely um, has the power to find uh, a company in the U.S. Um, the mechanism for it is, is still kind of under negotiation. Uh, you might actually have to answer to a U.S. regulatory the regulatory uh, agency under uh, uh, privacy shield obligations. Um, and as I mentioned there, um, uh, we're a little, um, uh, we're, we're a little uncertain about uh, 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 how explicitly privacy shield is going to be implemented on this end. Again, uh, the negotiations for it started under the previous administration, the current one, seems to be a little uh, be treating the issue with a little less urgency. Uh, so President Trump, for example, has not yet appointed uh, the uh, a head negotiator uh, uh, in for U.S. Privacy Shield GDPR negotiations there. So that there's a it's really something to kind of keep your eye on. But the fact that you're based in the U.S. is unlikely to shield you. Uh, from GDPR sanctions, the fines. Um, uh, so I would um, I would not use HIPAA a, as an example there. And you make a good point when you say you comply because of the opportunity. That that's probably reason enough to do it. You unless you're willing to walk away from you know EU customers, you're really going to have to take steps to comply. 
the final uh, piece of this question was, are there implementation specifications to comply? Yeah, this uh, if only. Um, it would be great if uh, the GDPR or rules and regulations kind of spelled out exactly what you have to do, uh, but they don't. There's a lot of language that says, you know, um, take all steps possible and uh, do these things with urgency and re respond with all possible speed. You know, the language is uh, somewhat ambiguous. Uh, they, uh, I, I think that's for practical reasons in part because it's just impossible um, uh, to set up super specific rules that would allow, that wouldn't impede a lot of uh, businesses from doing, uh, conducting business in the EU. Um, that said, uh, I, I think we're going to have to kind of watch and see uh, uh, after uh, the deadline for some sort of best practices uh, to emerge and uh, to see how the EU is choosing to enforce um, uh, GDPR. I, I wouldn't wait around for that to happen, um, uh, particularly if you're um, a good sized company, um, you, there's a good chance that they'll, they'll, you're on the list of people they'll use to make an example of here. Because uh, if they don't wave the stick, then uh, then uh, th that's obviously going to weaken um, compliance um, w with the regulations. But uh, the good news is, is I think that there's uh, there's plenty of advice out there, uh, pl plenty of consultancies and legal specialists who uh, have some real expertise in this area, and you probably ought to consider uh, uh, hiring some of that advice if you're looking for uh, uh, specific details of uh, uh, how to implement various uh, aspects uh, of the regulations. All right. Another question here, uh, Russell Dussam, how can an Acronis package allow us to pull information from various software packages? They're all different data storage methods, SQL, Access, Excel, custom data. If we were forced to clear customers' data, how can we have a sales record to nobody located nowhere? <laughs> that, that's an excellent question. I actually wrote um, a blog post about this that turned out to be such a long blog post that it's now two blog posts because this is, this is a really tricky question. Um, basically, uh, I actually I raised this subject earlier without actually going into detail about it, but this is a, a good opportunity to do it. Um, Think about all the different ways you capture customer data, all the different systems, all the different physical locations. Um, there's a good chance that uh, personal data that you're capturing on a particular individual is scattered all over the place, which means it's not in one easy to find backup archive and that it's gonna be a simple thing to do to just delete all that user's information. If you were lucky, or incredibly foresighted, maybe you could somehow organize your backup archives along individual user lines. But that strikes me as completely cuckoo and impractical. Nobody's really doing that. So what you have to recognize is that uh, the nature of backup and the purpose of backup means that you're going to keep some users' personal data around probably longer than they want to after they've made, uh, after they've exercised their right to be forgotten. In other words, they've r r said to you, erase all my data. And GDPR actually recognizes that there are some reasons you're going to keep, have to keep data around longer than the data subject is going to want you to. So for instance, you might be the subject of a lawsuit and the, uh, under uh, the rules of e-discovery, you've got to keep, uh, uh, preserve data, uh, all the data in, that was in your control in a particular period of time uh, while the lawsuit is going on so that uh, uh, it can be used to potentially as evidence in, in a lawsuit or a criminal trial. There's also, uh, you may be beholden to other uh, regulatory regimes, you know, if, uh, financial regulations or uh, healthcare regulations or industry trade rules that require you to keep data around for longer. GDPR recognizes that there, there are extenuating uh, circumstances for doing that. And what your job is to do in that situation is, A, if you have to restore an old archive 
uh, an old backup archive, say to recover from a breach or a, a hardware failure, or whatever. And in the process of doing it, you're restoring data that you've uh, previously erased in honoring the right to be forgotten in your production systems that you re-erase that data. So you've got to have a policy in place, a procedure in place that when you do a restoral, you check that against your deletion requests and make sure you re-delete the data. Um, absent that, um, you want to uh, follow those retention rules, the data minimization principles, so that you keep the data around only for the least amount of time that you have to. Third thing that you want to do is make sure that you're notifying the customer uh, who's made this re erasure request that some of their data is going to be kept around a little bit longer because it's in backup archives, but it's going to be inaccessible. It's going to be encrypted. The only scenario in which it'll possibly be uh, restored to a, a, a position in which anyone else could potentially use it again will be in a um, uh, recovery from backup scenario, in which case you're committing to uh, you are committing to re-delete it uh, from your production systems. And then, you know, be transparent with them about how long it's going to be kept around because of your other obligations for, say, e-discovery or other regulatory reasons. The fact that you need to protect uh, other customers' data in that archive and you can't delete their data without uh, deleting their backups as well. So I know that's kind of long-winded. That's, uh, that's about... Uh, a, a three minute summary of uh, about 2000 words of a blog post that I just published on this subject. So if you go to the Acronis blog, it's a two parter from last week and uh, uh, hopefully that uh, uh, goes into it a little bit more coherently. All right. Anonymous attendee asked, does Acronis use any AI technology in any way? Uh, I love that question. Um, because our um, active protection technology that I talked about, our anti-ransomware capability, uh, does in fact use machine learning. I, you know, I don't like AI is sometimes used to describe this. I think it's a little inaccurate. Usually, AI implies some kind of uh, interaction with a human uh, to uh, simulate uh, intelligence. Whereas machine learning is, you know, it's learning like a human does, but it's not pretending to be like a human because it's just operating in its machine environment. But our, um, our, our behavioral anti-ransomware technology, which basically looks for behaviors of ransomware, we're not looking at signatures like antivirus does. We're just looking to see like, uh, is somebody doing something that looks like what ransomware does? You know, move files around, start encrypting them unexpectedly, uh, that's what we look for, and we're capable of that, that ML uh, capability means it can learn uh, new uh, evasion techniques. Um, so uh, in that respect, we have artificial intelligence technology in our products today. We've had them out there for a year and a half, actually, in that uh, active protection to fight ransomware. We have other AI-based capabilities in development across the range of our products. Um, but that's something I have to say, it's a little too early to talk about publicly, so stay tuned for that. All right, thank you again. I think now we're through the questions. I wanna thank um, all of our attendees who uh, stayed for the questions and, and asked some very interesting ones. Uh, once again, this has been recorded, so you will be receiving it shortly. And at Acronis, we're really trying to um, help you prepare for GDPR. So as Jim mentioned, there's quite a few uh, white papers, documents, blog posts that you guys can take a look at, read, and learn a little bit more on how to prepare. Um, I'm going to stop the recording now. And thank you once again for attending today. Thanks, everybody.